Thank you, Brother Tom, for the introduction. Appreciate those of you who were too lazy to go over to hear Brother TJ speak this morning. Uh, oh, we've got so many here, we got overflow up in the balconies there. You know, I just can't, I can't believe that. It is an honor to be able to stand before you and to bring to you a portion of God's Word in this great lectureship. I, uh, I'm, I've spoken, this will be my third time, and I'm surprised every time I'm invited, especially after the first time and then after the second time, and all I can imagine is B.J. says, well, it can't get any worse, and so he's given me another opportunity. Um, you'll hear men stand here before you with great memories, men that will be able to speak to you from God's Word with great eloquence. Men that are masters of the king's English. My father was one such preacher. He just he could speak with such eloquence and using and using the king's English. And then there's me, and I just slaughter the king's English. You know, I did not go to a preaching school. I went to Freed Hardeman to be a coach. I graduated as a with a health and physical education degree, and. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the whole story about how, how I began preaching and have continued to preach, but just I'm just telling you that because I haven't been trained to preach. I don't know what I'm doing, so please, please be kind to me when I'm finished. I, will, I do promise you that I will use God's word, and that that will be that it's the most important thing we can do here. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, we read, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Here Moses is impressing upon us that there's a difference between man and God. Man lies. God does not. And so what we're going to be looking at here today is a promise that God has made, specifically when it comes to our relationship with him when it comes to giving. Because you see, if God keeps his promises, and do you believe that? That the God has made promises. If we believe his promises, if they are true, then we can know that the Bible is true. Everything depends upon the fact that God keeps his promises. Well, what has God promised concerning our topic this morning? That is concerning giving. Brother V.P. Black, who is a gospel preacher of times past, he, has, he, he preached many lessons, wrote many books concerning this topic of giving. Here's a quote that he has given us. If members of the church had as much faith in the promises of God concerning giving as they do concerning the promises Jehovah made about being baptized, We'd have enough money in a short time to evangelize the world if we believed God's promises. Brethren, how do you respond to God's promises about giving? Let's begin by looking at some of the promises that he made in the Old Testament concerning this topic. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, honor the Lord. Now, that's something I think we'd all agree on before we go any further, that we should honor the Lord. But then he goes on to tell us specifically how we should honor the Lord in this context. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall, be, shall burst out with new wine. Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Honor the Lord. How? By giving to him. But here he says in the book of Malachi, test me. Now, that's kind of interesting because in Psalm chapter 95, we're told that God did not appreciate the testing of the Israelites in the wilderness. He didn't want to be tested. But then he turns around here and he says to the Israelites, I want you to test me. See if, see if, if you don't give to me, that I don't return 
with much more than what you give. I am challenging you to be a liberal giver. Put me to the test. I'll open the windows of heaven. I'm going to pour out a great blessing so much that there's not going to be room enough for you to store it. Now, somebody might say, well, Brother Kid, well, I, I hear these promises that God made to those Israelites of old. But that is the old law, that is the Old Testament, and now we're in the New Testament era, we're, we're under the New Covenant. And so these promises, are we to expect them to apply to us? Well, probably, if we just think about it logically, by the time we got to the New Testament era, God was probably running out of resources, so he can't keep that promise to us to continue to give us back more than what we could give him. Is that what we should understand? Let's look at some promises in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. We're all very familiar with this, this passage. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things? The things that he's just been talking about that have to do with our daily necessities, food, clothing, shelter. All these things shall be added. These things will be given to you. Now, here's the promise. Put God first, and he's going to provide. Do we believe that? Is God first in our life? When it comes to giving, do we prove that to ourselves? Do we give as we've prospered, or do we just give? Do we give generously, or do we just give? Do we give sacrificially, or do we just give? Do we give cheerfully, or do we just give? Brethren, do we believe that God still keeps his promises? When he says, seek ye first the kingdom, put me first, and I am going to provide for your basic needs. Well, does our giving reflect that? Because, you see, brethren, if we believe that, then we would be a liberal giver. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38 Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. Notice the process. God says, Give to me first. Then you're going to receive. I'm going to give back to you. Now, sometimes, brethren, in talking about this particular topic, they complain of the hard times. We start talking about giving, and it's immediately, well, you just don't understand what I'm going through. At my, if I only had greater prosperity, I would be a liberal giver. If only I could give from an abundance, I would be a liberal giver. If only I would have an abundance left over after I give an abundance, I would be a liberal giver. You know, it reminds me of the, of the preacher that went out to visit one of his members who was a farmer. And he said to this particular brother, he said, Brother, Brother John, if the Lord blessed you today with $10,000, would you give 5000 of that back to the Lord? Brother John, the farmer, says, Oh, it would be with such great happiness. It would be such an honor. It would be such a blessing to me to be able to give a gift like that to the Lord. Then the preacher said, well, Brother John, if the Lord blessed you with two hogs, would you give one of them to the Lord? He said, well, that's not fair. You know I got two hogs. <laughs> but we can hardly meet, make ends meet. We can hardly make ends meet. You ever said that? Ever heard somebody say something like that? But look at the ends we're meeting. How many of us are paying for more than one house? How many of us are paying for more than one automobile? How many of us are paying for more than, more than, well, let me see, more than just one four-wheeler, one motorcycle, one trailer? How many of us spend more money on vacation in a year than we give to the Lord all year? Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 19, that if that be the case, if that is what's taking place, brethren, our treasures are here on earth where moth and rust are going to corrupt and thieves break in and steal. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Here's an example of, I see this in Luke chapter 5 where the Lord has been 
teaching the people, and he's asked Peter if he could get in his boat to push out and he could speak from the boat. And afterwards, he has this, this particular situation takes place where he tells Peter, I want you to go fishing again. Look, Luke 5, beginning verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your, ne- your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, notice there, this doesn't make any sense, Lord. We have fished all night. Let's, let's just be realistic. The fishing's just not good today. But at thy word, you see, realism goes out the door when we're just listening to God. Talking about being realistic, we're not talking about being realistic, we're talking about obedience. But at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draw to the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Pressed down, shaken together, running over you know we talk about this this particular setting this this story about the fishermen and catching the fish and this is one of the ones that our children hear quite a bit and they'll come out of the classroom with their color pa- picture of the net that's full of fishes and both boats are f- so full of fish that they're sinking these weren't rowboats. I don't think we understand just how impressive this is. Because you see, Peter, who is a fisherman, he's not just surprised, he is astonished. Why? Well, I did a little research on this and went to a site, academia.edu. These people did the math, had the diagrams, and had the resources, the historical resources they looked at to, talk, to see what type of fishing vessel this would have been from the archaeological digs. A, fish, a fishing vessel back then was about 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet deep, and 15 grown men could easily sit in the boat. That was the fishing boat. Now, according to the math, based upon this size of a vessel, each one of these boats, before it began to sink and as it began to sink, would have had over 31,000 pounds of fish for a total of about 63,000 pounds of fish between the two boats. And when you do the math based upon what people were being paid at that day and time, as far as a day's work and as far as what the fish would have, would have paid, for, their figures were that uh, between the four fishermen, they each would have had 60, 36 years worth of pay. Each of the four men could have retired that day. Peter is astonished. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And they forsook all and followed Jesus. They walked away from their retirement fund. Isn't that kind of stupid? Isn't that kind of foolish? For them to have that kind of 
They got a money right there. Somebody would say, well, you know, they should have they gone ahead and got that money and they could have done a lot of good for the Lord because, because, you see, God can't take care of you and give you what you need if you're putting him first and doing what he wants you to do. Second Corinthians 9, verse 6. Paul said, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Are you suffering, suffering through hardship, financial hardship? Are you going through hard times? Could it be that the reason for your present bad times is because of past unfaithfulness and putting God first if we reap sparingly? We're going to, it's going to be because we've sown sparingly. But Brother Kittle, let's, let's, let's put it down on paper here. Let me show you something. Here's how much money I make, and then I got to pay my mortgage, and I got to pay my utilities, and I got to make my car payments, and I got to make the internet payment, and I got to make the telephone payment, and I got to buy the groceries, and I got to take care of the kids, and we got, you know, we go through everything that we got to have. Okay, here's how much money I have left over. And out of how much I have left over, here's how much I can give God. Let's suppose I invited you over to my house for supper. And I'm cooking out on the grill steaks. And my wife has fixed... Uh, homemade rolls and mashed potatoes and gravy and green beans and corn casserole and, and, and iced tea sitting there and I'm coming in the house and those steaks are sizzling and popping and you can just smell all these good smells of food and you're ready to eat, you know, and I set it down the table and I said, okay, before we eat, we always do this. And I open the door and say, here dog, here, and my dog comes running in there and jumps on the table and starts eating. And when the dog has eaten all that he wants, I say, now we can sit down, we can eat. You say, well, Brother Kidwell has lost his mind. Because you see, that's not how we feed a dog, is it? No, what we do is we prepare a meal, and what's left over, we put in the refrigerator. And then we'll heat it up again later. And if there's something left, we'll heat it up again, put cheese on it, and call it casserole. And we'll eat it again later. And then when we finally had enough of it, we will give the dog the leftovers. Brethren, is that how we're treating God when it comes to our giving? Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increased. Who do you know that suffers because of their liberality? Who do you know that's suffering financial hardship and you're looking at them saying, well, I know why they're suffering. It's because they give so much to the Lord. Well, Brother Kid, well, please be realistic. You see, that's where we struggle. We're always talking about being realistic. Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 12, verse 41 through 44. We have a a setting here where Jesus is at the temple and he's sitting at a place where he can see people putting money in the treasury. Now, let's point this out. Jesus is watching people give to God. Some of our brethren act like, oh, well, nobody's supposed to know how much I give. It's a sin to know. No, it's not. It's a sin to give to be seen of men, but it's not a sin for somebody to know how much you gave because if that's the case, then the Lord is doing wrong because he's watching, and not only is he watching, but he tells his disciples, well, look at there what that woman put in. How much did she put in? Well, we would say this widow woman came along and she put in a couple of pennies in her money, and all these other people came by and they're throwing their $100 bills in there. And Jesus said, out of everybody that's given today, she has given the most. Well, why, Lord? Because, you see, they gave out of their abundance, and she gave out of, uh, well, actually, she gave her livelihood. 
She gave everything that she had. And if you'll notice the Lord, after he pointed out that she gave everything that she had, he said to his disciples, how foolish that she would give everything. Isn't that what she said? Isn't that what he said? Let me ask you this. Do you think that widow woman went to bed hungry that night? She gave her livelihood. Now, based upon the teachings of our Lord and the promises that God has made that if we put him first, that he's going to take care of us, do you believe that widow woman went to bed hungry that night? God doesn't need our money. So why does he ask us for it? Well, here's what I know about giving. Since I know God doesn't need it, and I need God, and God says that if I put him first, that he's going to take care of me, that when I give to God, that proves to me that I believe God's promises. And I need that. David wrote, I've been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalm 37, verse 25. What he says is, I, I was a young man, and now I'm an old man, and I have never seen anybody that put God first out begging. Is that an exaggeration, brethren? Do we believe the promises? What does it mean to give sacrificially? Well, first of all, let's understand there's three levels of giving. We can give less than our ability. We can give according to our ability. And we can give beyond our ability. Now understand what I'm about to say. It starts right back here, slaps me upside the head as it goes out there to y'all. Have you ever given beyond your ability? Who do you know that suffers because of their liberality? Well, Brother Kittle, God wants us to be good stewards with our money, and that's just not being realistic. Well, let's talk about what's being realistic when it comes to God and what he might expect and the examples that we have. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Where Paul's talking about these brethren from Macedonia, these poor brethren. Begin at verse 1, going through verse 5. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power... I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying as praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. How do the terms great trial of affliction and abundance of joy <laughs> go in the same verse? How does deep poverty and riches of their liberality, how do all of these phrases fit together in one verse? Well, the only way it can make sense is if we understand the conclusion, and that is they first gave themselves. Sadly, there are those who may have then and even now that may have criticized them for that. I mean, you think about it. Paul and those with them were hesitant to take their gift. Basically, he says, y'all have done enough. I know how much money you make. You've done enough. And they begged them, please take more. Is that being realistic? Everybody knows we should always keep something back for a rainy day.
Everybody knows that we need to have something set aside for just in case. You know what saddens me, even disgusts me to hear? When somebody says, well, I went and talked to these brethren about trying to help us with this work, a work that's in the, in the, in the brethren, the elder sat there and said, this is a good work, this is a worthy work, but we've already made our budget. All of our pennies are accounted for. Now, we've got a rainy day fund set aside over here in case our air conditioners go out and we have to replace one of them. But be ye warmed and filled. Because, you see, if they use their rainy day fund to help do the Lord's work where there's this need that they understand there's a need, God's not going to bless them for that. How foolish for them to use their rainy day fund. What they really mean, but not willing to verbalize out loud, is God doesn't provide for someone who's so foolish as to give from their rainy day, to give from what they might need and share it with others who do have a need. Be realistic. Were those brethren at Macedonia being realistic? Were they being good stewards with their money? If I refuse to, good, to do good today because of what I might need to do later, brother, my trust is misdirected. Jesus taught, again, Luke 6, verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Do we believe it? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Mm -hmm. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 again. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Let me ask you a question. If you had a creditor that made this bargain with you, you always pay my bill first, no matter what, you always make sure you pay me, and if you have a problem meeting any of your other obligations, I'll help you with it. If you had a creditor that would make that bargain with you, who are you going to pay first every time? And yet we've got God saying, put me first. See, I believe the creditor. I believe him. I can see him. I can touch him. I can see his money. I can see... And God says, put me first, and I'll help you meet those other needs. I'll take care of Do we believe it, brethren? Where's our heart? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, verse 21 You know, Peter, at one occasion, Matthew 19, 29, and also Mark 10, 29, has asked a question about, Lord, you know, we've left everything to follow you. What's going to be our return, our benefit, our reward? And the Lord said, you're going to be rewarded 100-fold. That's 10,000%. You know, that's, that's just crazy. You know, it's one thing to say, I, I'm going to double. Every, anything you give to me, I'm going to double. Anything you give to me, I'm going to triple. Anything you give to me, I'm going to give you 10 times back. 10,000%. Well, 
You see, God uses numbers like that, and we just, we just start wanting to be realistic. Somebody might say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know that that applies to us and what he was talking to Peter and the apostles and, and, the, and the sacrifices that they made. And is he talking about you know, spiritual blessings or physical blessings? Brethren, here's what we can get out of it because the principle is still true. It still applies. You can't outgive God. I guess what it comes down to when we start talking about first giving ourselves, first giving ourselves has to do with um, do we have a reason, a motivation to give ourselves? If you had a child that was deathly ill, needing some very expensive treatment, and your insurance isn't going to cover it all, and there, it's just far beyond anything that you're able to do, are you going to say, well, there's nothing that we can do. Oh, well. No, as long as there's breath in that child's life, you're still going to be searching for ways to come up with income to help pay that bill, aren't you? As long as there's life in your body, you're going to be looking for ways in which you're going to be able to take care of your loved one. Why? Because we love our children. Our child could lose her physical life if they don't get this help. Mm. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people are dying every day because they're spiritually sick. Do we love the lost? What is God capable of doing? I can't help but think back to Jonathan. When the Israelites are hiding in the holes from the Philistines, and he says to his armor bearer, come on, let's go fight. It's just me and you, but the armor bearer says, whatever you say, I'm with you, we'll go. Because Jonathan says, who knows but what, whether, uh, whether it be one, many, or few, God is able Well, you know the story. That's not being realistic, brother. To say that two men are going to go take on the whole Philistine army, which we're told in the description that there's more soldiers than the sands of the sea as you look at them. That's just plain stupid when we talk about being realistic. But God had promised a long time ago, a long time ago, one of you would be able to, I forgot how many he said he could chase. But he said one of you would be, and what was it? He and his, his armor bearer took on 25 immediately. And confusion took place. The bottom line is, when we start talking about what we can do, and being realistic, then we're limiting God. If God has, now I'm not talking about asking for miracles, I'm talking about the providence of God working in our lives based upon the promises of God. If rather knew how we did things at Branson, you would say, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to even talk about it. But here's how we do things. Somebody comes in and they say, we need help. And we know how much money it takes for us to pay our bills every month. And we know how much it's going to take next month. And somebody comes in and they say, we need help. This is a work of the Lord. We don't know whether the Lord's going to... The world's going to continue into next month. 
if we got the money today and there's a work of the Lord that needs help, and we have it, we help them. And the work at Branson is just dwindling up and just fizzling away because we're so stupid. I'm not saying that to be braggadocious, brother. I'm saying that to, say, to point out that God keeps his promises. And I'm sure in your life, if you've put him to the test, that you've seen the result. God keeps his promises. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Thank you for your attention. We've had an opportunity to hear 